over how the collapse has affected the countries straddling the border between East and West. August the 31st, 1994, the last Russian troops leave Berlin. It's a ceremonial display of friendship between the two powers who are historically and again the big players on the European stage, Germany and Russia. Должен стать первый днем будущего. It is a brave face to put on so ignominious an end, to march out singing goodbye Germany, an army that for so long held half the continent under Soviet control. The collapse of the Soviet Union has left a military and security vacuum in its wake. There is uncertainty and apprehension among Germany's eastern neighbours. A crisis of identity, a disputed sense of belonging at Germany's back door. It is an inauspicious place to begin a search. Europe's eastern frontiers have no natural definition, no great valleys or mountain ranges to contain nations. Borders here divide artificially. They are no more than lines on maps, as easily rubbed out as they are drawn. We West Europeans used to know where our eastern frontier lay. It lay along the Iron Curtain, and it was fixed as firmly in our minds as it was drawn through the heart of our continent, the eastern edge of our Western, liberal, free market civilization. Here on the River Bug, three countries converge. Ukraine, Poland, and Belarus, White Russia. These are the debatable lands, the flat, vulnerable steppe country that lies between Germany and Russia. History has been cruel to these lands. Now their future is uncertain. The Soviet Empire has receded. To what do they owe their allegiance now? These lands are debatable again. The borderlands across which Europe's great empires have ebbed and flowed are home to a hundred million people in three nations that share a common predicament. How to achieve sovereignty without provoking their powerful neighbors. The European order is changing, new security structures are emerging, exerting their pull here. Poland has set its face firmly to the West, claiming what it sees as its rightful inheritance as a fully European nation-state. Belarus, ethnically and historically in the shadow of Greater Russia, is independent, but reluctantly so. And Ukraine, Europe's greatest single landmass, straddles both east and west, trying to reconcile two opposing forces.
Stalin said forcing socialism on the poles was like putting a saddle on a cow. Moscow's most troublesome satellite was the first to escape. Now it's an odd clash of cultures, Western consumerism and Stalinist overstatement. The tomb of the unknown soldier remains a place of homage. In World War II, these were Europe's killing fields. Poland knows the price that can sometimes be paid for too vigorous an assertion of sovereignty. It is a price written here in stone. In 1939, I mogło wpłynąć na późniejsze moje kształtowanie się świadomości. Potem przeżyłem ciężki dramat deportacji na Syberię. Praca w Tajdze. Ojciec w Łagrze. Ojciec zmarł z wycieńczenia, tam pochowany. In 1981, Jaruzelski imposed martial law on Poland. He's writing his memoirs now, his reputation redeemed as the man who kept at bay the threat of Russian intervention, a threat, he says, that has not gone away. Związanych z bezpieczeństwem Polski. Poland is in no doubt as to the defenses it must build, nor in which direction they must face. Eastwards. The frontier towns feel it most keenly. They have good reason to want their eastern flank defended. Cheum is infamous in Poland for a single day in 1944. But when communism collapsed, the townspeople removed the commemorative plaques from this concrete obelisk. It is not a day of which they were proud. The memory of that day has been locked away, a memory that has come to represent a false history, an identity imposed from outside. It is a memory consigned now to the vaults of the local museum. In July 1944, Poland's first communist government entered the country at Cheum, imposed by Moscow. They made this town for one day their symbolic capital. The stone plaque commemorating the event no longer sees the light of day. The history of Los Angeles has been a little bit of a mess from our city, saying that the events here did not have place here. Here Stalin, as if under his own egidy, tworzył nowe władze, tworzył nową rzeczywistość, no, która y, dla wielu Polaków była dosyć trudna do przyjęcia. I... Cheum was the gate through which Stalinism entered Poland. This declaration, the instrument by which Stalin tried to saddle a restless but subordinate nation. Rousseau said of the Poles that they could be swallowed, but they could not be digested. They always re-emerge. A Polish history, a Polish identity, dormant for 50 years, is re-emerging. These veterans fought first Germany, then the Soviets. They were the embodiment of one of the central planks of Polish sovereignty. A national army. Their defeat brought them disaster. Because I was a witness I saw it. Mieszkając w Kowlu, jak deportowano ludność polską. W wagonach towarowych rzucono tylko słoma i byłem świadkiem i sam brałem w tym udział, kiedy zamrożone dzieci zakupywaliśmy koło torów kolejowych, zanim ten pociąg nie odjechał na wschód. The tyranny that entered Poland at Cheum did not permit them even a history of their own. They were written out of the national memory, officially forgotten. Ta propaganda anti-Akoska, która się rozpętała w latach 44, 45 do 46, w żadnym wypadku mnie nie podbudowała 
tylko byłem zaszczuty, jak ten obywatel drugiej kategorii, który nie ma w przyszłości w zasadzie żadnych szans. I to była największa moja tragedia. There is darkness as well as light here. The peoples of the debatable lands are sinned against, but they have also sinned and sinned against each other. Helm Cathedral has been Eastern Orthodox, Greek Uniate, and is now Catholic, swapping denominations with the rise and fall of imperial fortunes. The cult of the Black Madonna is powerful here, and now as much as ever. In Helm, this ancient symbol is stained in new glass. She is credited with warding off foreign invaders. It is a recurring preoccupation here. The cathedral is Polish again. But the cemetery speaks of a different allegiance. These are Ukrainian graves. The descendants of these dead were driven out by the Poles. They return once a year as visitors. They are Ukrainians attending a Russian Orthodox service on Polish territory. How can a nation state take root on land to which two or more nations lay claim? Only by means of what we now call ethnic cleansing. The Poles and Ukrainians of these borderlands were familiar with the practice long before Serbs and Croats coined the phrase. Strzeliali każdy noc. Nasz dom był pod blachą, to jedne dziury tylko na dzisiejszy dzień. Strzeliali, żeby nas wygnać. A później przyszedł Polak i mówi tak, jak jutro wy nie wyjedziecie, to już was nie będzie. Zabiję. Jak nas obybrali i moja mama poszła prosić kawałek chleba. O, tak my żyli. Tak nam zrobili. No, może jest i dobre Polaki, no ja ich się boję. The church is the bedrock of national identity. A service conducted in Russian is, in these lands, an expression of allegiance. The church is also ethnic division in institutionalized form. Nadal się potocznie mówi, jedziemy do Ruskich albo jedziemy na wschód. Tutaj się nie odróżnia Litwy, Łotwy, Ukrainy, Białorusi oficjalnie tak, ale nieoficjalnie to są wszystko Ruscy. Ja myślę, że Polacy się muszą do tego przyzwyczaić, że Związek Radziecki już nie istnieje, że istnieje Ukraina. It is a local enmity that could help divide Europe again. The Poles are preparing for full membership of NATO. During the Cold War, 70% of their armed forces were in the west of the country, their guns trained on Germany. Now they are relocating, turning their turrets around. These are still Russian-made tanks, but for the first time they face east, toward Belarus and Ukraine. But there are risks. Wracam uporczywie do tego pojęcia parasola, że ten parasol trzeba mieć i że liczymy, że za tą rączkę Parasola trzymają kraje zachodniej Europy, trzymają Stany Zjednoczone, ale nie powinien to być parasol, którym będziemy wojowniczo wymachiwać i który byłby odbierany na wschód w Rosji jako akt nieprzyjazny w stosunku do niej. It is a fine line to tread, to build an effective defense without provoking a Russian backlash. W Rosji trwa proces rewolucyjny. Jeśli w następstwie tego procesu rewolucyjnego, jeżeli on obejmie armię rosyjską, jeżeli ta rewolucja rosyjska zacznie przybierać formy brutalne, no to nam grozi, że ten pożar będzie się przesuwał także na zachód, może nas objąć i my tu nie jesteśmy na pewno przygotowani, żeby się przed tym obronić.
The Poles know that the Russians are never very far away. They are just across the border. In Belarus, there are 40,000 Russian troops. When you cross the river Bug from the Polish side to the fortress city of Brest, you enter a different world. There is no gradual change. It is instantly recognizable, the Slavic East. Its ancient beauty as unmistakable as its regimented modern soullessness. For 200 years, this was the western edge of the Russian Empire. Catherine the Great took this place from the Poles, and Tsar Nicholas I built this fortified barrier, defining the frontier between east and west in a great defensive wall. The character of Brest, and perhaps even of the Belarusian people, is moulded by their strategic purpose. But Nicholas's wall has crumbled, and the Russian, then Soviet empire it protected, has gone, leaving the people here with no purpose they can point to in search of a new allegiance, and so far, finding neither. The fortress was destroyed in 1941, and the Soviets built a vast war memorial on its site. Belarusians seem caught in a time warp, clinging to icons of a previous age. But they bring their children here to instill in them, amid all this monumental Soviet grandeur, a sense of what it is to be Belarusian. These images resonate still here. The monuments are Soviet, but the tradition they represent of the Biela Russians as a fortress people predates the Soviet Union and has outlived it. The images represent continuity, certainty. Почему мы сюда приходим? Потому что именно защитники крепости как бы сконцентрировали в себе все то, что, чем обладали э, прежние поколения брещан. Они за эту землю сражались до последней капли крови, умирая от недостатка воды, от страшной жары, от ран. To Belarusian nationalists, the memorial symbolizes only loss, the burying of their nation beneath Soviet concrete. Национальная идея – это европейская идея. Национальная идея родилась в истории Европы. И национальное государство тоже – это идея европейская. На Востоке была другая идея – идея имперского государства. Было уничтожено за период советской власти свыше двух миллионов человек. Мы пережили период геноцида. There is a search for Belarus's lost soul, its holy grail, a conscious attempt to create for the people an ancient lineage and for the nation a mystical origin. In a one-roomed flat in a concrete tower block, a lone artist is building a holy relic, or at least its replica. Пока не состоится, не состоится возрождение осознания самого народа, где он живет, на какой земле он живет. До тех пор мы, естественно, будем зависеть от России. К сожалению, история забыта. И когда памятник будет все-таки возродиться, я думаю, возродится и память. Возвращается она. Но когда возродится памятник, и возродится память к нашим предкам. А память к нашим предкам возродит у нас наши корни. Кто мы такие на этом месте, на земле белорусской. It was an 11th century cross of gold and silver, said to contain a stone from Mary's grave. It disappeared in 1941, plundered by the Germans or by the Russians, no one really knows. And few care. Belarus, if it had a distinct identity, has been so Russified that it did not even seek independence. It had independence thrust upon it. The cost of 70 years of Soviet mismanagement is measured in the poverty of the Belarusian countryside, the great labor-intensive collective farms. Mm -hmm. 
Not only did the Soviet Union impoverish this land, it poisoned it. I think that whole generation of children all over the Republic is affected by radiation. 70% of the fallout from Chernobyl landed on Belarusian soil. I can maybe tell that this is a genocide against the population. Genocide? Genocide, yes. Genocide because the authorities could, in those crucial early days, have taken measures to combat the radiation. They chose instead to deny the disaster had even happened. This girl is direct from Chernobyl area. Her name is Natasha. What is the prognosis for children who come here from those very contaminated regions? Uh, so the prognosis, especially for T-cell leukemia, is 50%. If Natasha survives, her chances of having healthy children of her own are negligible. Sometimes I don't know what to do because the medicaments, I know that it, it, it will finish next week. And what can we do? Because we cannot interrupt uh, the treatment. You know that our success of treatment depends on how you, how you make it. It's, sometimes it's crazy for the doctors, knows how to treat and knows that this child can be survived, sure. But he has no drugs or maybe he's limited in drugs, doesn't matter. This is really a big tragedy for the doctor. Belarus, deploring its dependence on the system that caused this, is, for all that, as tied to that system as ever, reliant upon it for vital life support. The infant republic, too sick to stand alone. Its capital city, Minsk, cannot afford to power the lights that proclaim it a hero city. Belarus is wholly dependent on Russia for its energy. получится демократическое государство. Покуда будет империя, Россия никогда не будет демократическим государством. Это иллюзия. But the Belarusian government knows that fate has tied its hands. Our strategic position is based uh, mostly on our history because Russia was the main guarantee of our uh, security. Uh, that's why uh, I suppose that we have to have uh, very close, uh, even military contacts uh, with Russia. Geopolitical instincts uh, will uh, dictate uh, future, and uh, the balance of forces, the balance of forces will be most important. And you're emphatically with Russia? Yeah. The national symbol of Belarus is a docile beast, the central European bison that roams these forested flat lands, hunted by generations of Russian, then Soviet, ruling elites. In December 1991, three of the most important men in the Soviet Union took this road to hold a secret meeting that was to change the geostrategic map of Europe. Presidents Yeltsin of Russia and Kravchuk of Ukraine, and the Belarus chairman Shushkevich. This was one of the secret places of the old Communist Party bosses. Leonid Brezhnev came here at the height of Soviet supremacy to indulge his passion for the hunt. The local staff remember him in his younger days as a crack shot with a hunting rifle. Here he played host to communist leaders from across the world. How strikingly ironic that it was here that the leaders of three Soviet republics met to sign an agreement that finally killed off the very system that had brought them all to power. Those three buried the Soviet Union here and replaced it with the new Commonwealth of Independent States. Belarus embraced the treaty with enthusiasm, seeing in its security certainty, a reconstituted post-Soviet Union. That night, Presidents Yeltsin and Kravchuk slept in the splendor of the secret dacha. Belarus's Shushkevich, as befits his republic status, took the lodge at the foot of the drive. But the decisive player then, as now, was Ukraine. 
when they signed, they did so for wholly different reasons. The night train from Minsk to the Ukrainian capital Kiev takes 14 hours, a journey through the dark expanses of Ukraine's vast open plains. Ukraine, the very name means borderland, frontier, from the Slavic word kraj, meaning end or edge. Kiev is not Ukrainian at all. It is the birthplace of their own national identity, the cradle of all Slavic culture. Saint Volodymyr brought Eastern Orthodox Christianity to the Slavs in 988 and established Kievan Rus as his seat. Can this now be fully European? To Western analysts, it is among the most critical of questions. Ukraine, more than any other country, will determine the strategic shape of the new Europe. I believe that if we're talking about uh, demolishing completely the legacy of the bipolar confrontation, that the, uh, uh, the focal point, the, the crux of the, uh, the whole debate will focus on the development of Poland and Ukraine. The CIS cannot develop into a predatory uh, Russian-dominated neo-imperial structure if Ukraine is not a part of the CIS or if Ukraine is not fully integrated into the CIS. Ukraine did not sign the CIS treaty to reconstitute the Soviet Union. In Kiev, Lenin has been taken off his marble pedestal. Nothing has been put in his place. Ukraine is keeping its options open. It has to. It is a deeply divided country. It feels the pull of the East and the pull of the West in almost equal measure. It has to reconcile the two in a single polity. This is where the pool of the East is strongest. This city of a million people was once the best kept secret in the Soviet Union. So sensitive was its location that it appeared on no maps. This factory was designed so that it could not be detected from the air. Its workers had the most prestigious and the best paid jobs, the heroes of Soviet labor. They built nuclear missiles. There are two Ukraines at work in this place, each pulling in separate directions. First, there is the old Ukraine, Soviet Ukraine, a country of vast production lines tied to markets further east that were Soviet made and are now lost. And then there is the Ukraine of the new national aspiration, the potential Ukraine, symbolized in this city by a once prestigious aerospace industry. That is the Ukraine that could help break the ties with the East. But the Ukraine of the aspiration remains for now no more than that, a potential still far from realized. <laughs> Three years ago, this factory carried the hopes of the new Ukraine. It promised an independent space industry, but it stalled on takeoff. It cannot survive alone. It needs its old Soviet partners. Они же Данил всегда говорил, что это должна быть сотрудничество с Россией, с Казахстаном, создаваться эта программа, потому что на Украине нету сегодня своего стартового комплекса, нету полигонов своих и Ну, очень многих компонентов нет. Поэтому я считаю, что нам надо объединяться с Россией, с Казахстаном и вместе поддерживать ту ракетную систему, космическую систему, которая была создана. Другое дело, что эта космическая, украинская космическая программа войдет какой-то частью вот в ту большую программу, которую там должны создавать эти республики. Ukraine's defense industry has undergone a hurried and inadequate conversion to civilian production. The heroes of Soviet labor no longer make state-of-the-art missile systems. They are reduced to making trolley buses they find hard to sell.
They make a few thousand tractors each year for export to former Soviet client states in the third world. That is what the loss of the Soviet Union meant here. Local people say it is as though a surgeon were asked to become a courtyard sweeper. There is an almost palpable nostalgia for the old links. Do you think Ukraine should try to re-establish those links with Russia and the other republics to try to get that economy going again? There is no such nostalgia here. In Lvov, Polish is as widely spoken as Ukrainian, for this was, until 1939, a Polish city, its roots in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It retains the spirit of Central Europe, and its aspirations are unequivocally Western. As in Poland, the church is at the heart of the national identity. It survived Soviet Russification, a sustained campaign to bring it under the control of the Russian Orthodox Church. Catholic priests caught celebrating the mass went to labor camps. Theirs is a remarkable story of courage and conviction. They spent their lives taking on the KGB, and in the end, they won. Archbishop Volodymyr Sterniuk served a five-year sentence cutting wood. He's 86 now. Theirs is a mongrel church in a mongrel land, a fusion of two traditions. It has the trappings of Eastern Orthodoxy. It preserves Byzantine ritual. When the bishop blesses the congregation by crossing the candles, the response comes not in Latin, but in Greek. The original clergy came from Constantinople. This is the Greek Catholic Church. It acknowledges the authority of the Pope and the dogma of Rome. It is firmly a part of Western Christianity. It made itself a vehicle for the survival of the nation. It was anathema to the Soviets. There are secular places of worship in the new Ukraine too. Hidden in the deepest reaches of the Ukrainian countryside, a partisan army held out for years against the Soviet occupation, a nationalist guerrilla force, ineffective against Soviet might, but refusing to bow. This place was known as Golden Meadow, it held six guerrilla units, each a hundred strong. What do we have here? This землянка называется розвідка. У цій землянці жили люди, які мали спеціальне завдання займатися розвідкою. Що воно означало? They are rebuilding the site as a museum, daring after 50 years to remember and record a past hitherto denied them. He was a messenger running secret errands between guerrilla units. She, a nurse who went into hiding for five years. I 
а ми боронили свою землю. Свій край і свій, і свій народ. Варта, я щаслива, я ще живу на своїй вільній Україні, і умирати так хочу на ній. Тому що вона поз'їхає на Україну. Вони і далі, і то Кирилєсту, та Верховна Рада, там немає нічого, там все большевецькі, все бувші комуністи. Там большевецька пропаганда, вона далі існує, і далі вони хочуть. The Russians see it differently. This arch of friendship was a gift from Russia to Ukraine in 1954 to celebrate Kiev's surrender 300 years earlier to Muscovite supremacy in return for protection against the Poles. Local people call it the yoke. It weighs most heavily on the young, but an attempt is being made to establish a new westward-leaning liberal elite. These students are taking their degrees not in their own tongue, but in English, language as a window on the wider world. Plato, through his character Socrates, is constructing a city in speech. Why is he doing this? Why is he creating the Republic in this conversation? The justice is in relations between people, and uh, these relations uh, we can see only in, uh, in a community. It is a bold experiment, part American, part Ukrainian, part privately funded. The school is three years old. In only one branch of These are the first students in generations to have the opportunity to opt out of the state system, a system they associate with the insularity of the old Soviet days. I think Russification means uh, quite um, a greater deal than just Russian language. It mean, means corruption, it means the old system, it means um, not only uh, the Soviet Union, it means only the Tsarist Russia, which uh, was on our, uh, dominating our lands for uh, 300 years, and uh, this means a lot to me. It has been an imperialistic nation for years, years and years, back to, well, way back to the hi in the history, like uh, Tsarist Russia was an imperialistic nation, don't you think so? And uh, I think Russia still has uh, imperialistic ambitions. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. When you think of Zhirinovsky as uh, one of the most popular men in, in Russia, in Russia. Yeah. Uh, it's just um, uh, the, uh, the logical conclusion that comes out of it. It's still, it has still uh, in mind uh, that uh, Russia should be a messiah to all those Slavic nations. And we don't want that kind of messiah. The main point here, well, we'll get out of Russia, so now we're free, so what are we going to do next? And here, there's an important thing, that we're supposed to stay our own country and not become, like, Americanized country or something like that. It can happen, it could happen. So I think that at this point of time, we're supposed to think about our Ukrainian roots, about our Ukraine, not like Americanized or Jap Japanized Ukraine or something like that, about Ukraine. The question dominates Ukraine's political life, how to step out from an Eastern sphere of influence, how to break down the barrier that divides East from West. There is, Ukraine says, only one way. We have to design a new approach, a new concept of all European system of security, uh, which will be free from the division of the continent into military blocks. Where would the center of gravity in such a system be? Where would the real decision-making power lie? Very interesting question. It's a question for uh, to be a subject of a separate conference. Uh, well, uh, I would tell you that uh, I know the answer on this uh, question, but uh, I would prefer rather not to answer it. What's your, well, what are your doubts about it? Well, I think that uh, the time has not come yet for uh, giving the answer. The fear Ukraine will not articulate is of a new division of Europe, a widening gulf between itself and Poland. Ukraine wants to build a security still zone at the heart of the continent that is neither east nor west, but neither Poland nor Belarus wants to join. The Western European border currently, I believe, ends at the Ukrainian-Polish border. 
Ukraine's in danger of being perceived to, uh, as being indecisive and of in fact gravitating towards CIS. International politics, just like nature, abhors a vacuum. And as long as Ukraine uh, continues to leave this impression of indecision, others will make its choices for it. Ukraine's gateway to the West is Poland. The Poles hold the key to Ukraine's geostrategic future. And Poland is westward bound, too fast for a Ukraine that is too divided to follow. Poland is proving its credentials, preparing for full membership of the Western world, establishing itself as the eastern flank of fortress Europe. If we Ukraińcy, Białorusinom, Rosjanom, że należą do Europy B, do Europy drugiej kategorii, to prawdopodobnie znacznie trudniej byłoby budować tą jednolitą Europę. I chodzi o to, żeby szukać tego, co, co łączy, a nie to, co dzieli. The peoples of these debatable lands share a common impulse and common fears. The impulse to step out from under the shadow of Russia. The conviction, however vaguely formulated, that they are rightfully European. If our Western liberal free market civilization has an eastern frontier, it no longer lies along the Iron Curtain. It runs through these territories. But its location will not be determined by the people who live here. They have seldom in their history been able to decide their own fate. Their aspiration to be fully European is constrained by an accident of geography, their proximity to Russia. And their hopes for the future are constrained by their experience of the past. The peoples of the disputed borderlands have always had their allegiances decided for them by the great powers. The great powers in new transnational form are aligning again over Central Europe. A new bipolarity is settling on our continent. The line of demarcation is elusive, shifting, but a line is being drawn. The question that remains for the peoples of the debatable lands is who will be on this side and who on that. <laughs>